Are you ready to overcome the complexities and burdens that come with your success? Join the team at Centura Wealth Advisory in the Live Life Liberated podcast. Now, on to the show. Hello and welcome to Live Life Liberated with the team from Centura Wealth Advisory. Today, Derek Myron has brought on a special guest and that is Paul Johnson. Paul is a partner at Procopio. Mr. Johnson helps entrepreneurs and their investors get companies formed, funded, and sold, including initial formations of corporations and LLCs, negotiation of seed, early and mid-stage equity financing, and both buy and sell mergers and acquisitions. Derek, how are you, man? I'm great. How are you, Eric? I'm doing fantastic. I, I appreciate you bringing Paul on the show. Why is he joining us today? Two weeks ago, we interviewed M&A bankers, mm -hmm. mergers and acquisition bankers. And today, as a follow-on, we thought it'd be great to bring in mergers and acquisition lawyers. I could think of no better than uh, Paul Johnson. Paul, welcome to the show. Thank you, Derek. The market, I know you were concerned at first when COVID hit last year, like, oh gosh, it's going to be a terrible year. Things turned around last year after initial COVID hit. Tell us, how, how was the year last year and what do you see for, for this year? Now, last year was actually pretty productive, which is, uh, it is surprising given where we started first quarter. Everyone was pretty worried, but uh, for whatever reason, the markets didn't fall apart like they could have. Say, you know, wherever you will, whether it's stimulus or just optimism, but, or just money being on the sidelines. Deals kept, ha kept happening. We kept getting term sheets, letters of intent on our clients, and we kept doing deals. And we actually had a, a very good year firm-wide. We, we wore out a few associates in the process, I'll tell you. <laughs> well, tell us, tell us about your background, education, family, and the firm that uh, you're a partner in. I graduated undergrad from Brigham Young University uh, way back when, you know, antediluvian days, and then uh, stayed there for law school and MBA school. I did a joint degree at JD MBA. Finished about 25 years ago now. Started my career by going to a, a large firm that I'll leave unnamed because I'm not there anymore. Up in the Bay Area, I spent the first few years there. After a few years, I said, hey, San Diego is a good looking market. Do you want to send me down there? I'd love to go. And they said, sure, that'd be great. So they sent me down here. We bought our first home in San Diego. Uh, I spent a few more years at that firm and then uh, saw the light. Joined my current firm, uh, Procopio. It's been a number of years now, 13 years ago. We're the largest local firm in San Diego, meaning we have the most lawyers of any firm, at least to my knowledge. That, that was the stat last I heard it. We, we service quite a few companies, a lot of different industries from brick and mortar to technology. And we help kind of local entrepreneurs r help run their businesses with the legal side of things. And as it turns out, many of them end up getting uh, letters of intent to want to sell their, their companies. And so we end up helping them through the process. We help them with the legal work as it leads up to that too, so that they're prepared. When they come to us and say, hey, you know, Paul, can I do this in the ordinary course of representation? And I'll say, hey, you know, yes, you can, or no, you can't, but, or maybe you can, but you ought to have in your mind that this is gonna maybe not look so good when you look to be acquired when someone's doing diligence on you. So we've got that in the back of our mind the whole time we're working with companies. That's great. How big is the Procopio's M&A legal group? 15 or so attorneys uh, between partners and associates a paralegal or two in there as well. I think the number was we, we did uh, over 60 deals last year. I think it was over a billion dollars worth of transactions. Lots and lots of work, lots and lots of people keeping busy. We have a number of partners that are out there meeting clients, uh, bringing in new work. And then we have a, a full bench of associates to help us get that work done. What's the size of deal? You said a billion dollars in total, but min, max, median, what, what, what size transactions do you guys typically work on? Yeah, there really isn't a limit either on top or bottom end. There are definitely some efficiencies, meaning an M&A deal involves a lot of the same work, whether it's a million dollar or $10 million deal or a hundred million dollar deal, at least the, the work that should be done. Given where we are, we kind of, I have in the back of my mind that it makes more sense when you're looking at selling your company for $10 million or more to, to give us a call. If you're under 10 million, I've done plenty of deals that are under 10 million. But we get to the point where we're having to have conversations with our client about, you know, we need to probably tailor back some of the stuff we'd ordinarily do. Otherwise, the, the bill may be disproportionate to what they're getting in terms of proceeds. And so we'll give the clients a choice like, you know, hey, here, here's what you can do. Here's what we can, we can talk about to reduce the bill. But once you get over $10 million in purchase price, then we're, we're starting to be in the range where it's pretty comfortable for us to do everything that the client really needs us to do. And then again, there's no real top end. We've done deals over a billion dollars in size, just an individual deal before. We, 
we tend to see deals really in, I would say, the $30 million to a couple hundred million dollar range in terms of purchase price. That's I would say our sweet spot is, and that's probably more driven by geography. Those are kind of the sizes of the what we call the middle market companies in San Diego. The middle market's different in every market you go to, but uh, that's what we are seeing here. And we're comfortable with all of those sizes of deals and we're negotiating them all the time. I'm sure. And is the mo- majority of your guys' work on the disposition side or on the acquisition side or both? You know, it used, used to be it was more dispositions. We used to say it was about 70%, but actually it was 50-50 last year, which was pleasing okay. for us because the the problem, of course, with a disposition is you're selling a company, you're selling a client, and the, the buyer may or may not engage you. The buyer obviously has an attorney already to do the deal when you're working opposite the buyer's attorney in this process. And so they don't really need you necessarily unless they're just, you know, in awe of your work and that's happened before. But by and large, the the buyer already has their attorney. So when you're selling a client, they go away. And now when we're doing more buy side work, it's nice because we're we're doing a lot of these very detailed transactions on the buy side, but we're getting to do it more and more often for the same client. If we get an acquisitive client, that's kind of our, you know, nirvana. We, we love having clients that are very busy buying a lot of companies. And we've had more. It wouldn't surprise me if we cross the, the line at some point where it's more buy side just because they are repeat customers. I started this off to kind of ask you what you saw for last year, what happened last year. And then kind of tell us, what do you, what do you see for 2021? What's, uh, what are some of the common themes that you're hearing from business owners that you serve? Well, the, the interesting thing is there's just a lot of money still that, that that's out there. Uh, someone showed me a chart of the money supply, which may be unrelated slightly, but it's it's indicative, I think. And the money supply after the various stimulus packages have been passed has just spiked. And there's a lot of money uh, as well on the sidelines being raised to do deals. You might have heard of kind of the SPAC craze, special purpose acquisition companies. The SPACs have been out there raising money to do deals with companies. They've got uh, hundreds of hundreds of billions or I don't know how much the total is. I haven't seen the stats, but lots and lots of cash uh, with comp- with SPACs, these entities uh, where the promoters are out there looking for good companies to buy. And that means that a company that's a, a good company is going to enjoy a, a good valuation, a good healthy valuation. And as a matter of fact, some of the companies are a little bit less healthy or probably still enjoy good valuations because people are motivated to find deals. So I, I expect things to continue to go well in the market for 2021 as this money gets allocated and as these, uh, not just SPACs, but private equity, we've seen that obviously the last number of years, lots of private equity money. I think that's going to continue to be spent. If you are an entrepreneur and, and, and you have a good business, you're kind of the right size for these, these companies to buy. I would expect you're going to have phone calls and you're going to have letters of intent tossed your way and you're going to need to have someone take a look at it for you. Yeah, I we we had two clients that launched SPACs here in the last month or two, and they're fully subscribed, and they're going to get the additional, you know, the extra fifteen percent with the shoe. People are wanting to put money in these deals, and on the other side of the coin, I'm talking to business owners that were like, "Gosh, we got to take our company out there because so and so got this kind of valuation, and we don't think we'll ever get that valuation again." So it feels very frothy from the limited information of where I sit. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, we see lots of deals, lots of action. It's feeling very active. And, you know, when, when you start thinking about if a company is maybe even not a super healthy company, but they may find a good valuation, then you're starting to think, well, how, where are we on this wave? How long is it going to go? I expect it's going to continue. At some point, there's always a correction, right? It, these things go in cycles and we don't know when that's going to be, but the market's hot right now. And if you're an entrepreneur and you're listening to this, I would think you probably ought to be thinking, you know, can I, can I do an exit in this market? These markets tend to, they come around every, what, seven or eight years. I forget what the cycle is. It's about the length of it. And then it, it goes away and everybody kind of retrenches. Then it takes a few years for the, for you to hit the bottom of the trough and then to come up the other side. And so you're probably, what, seven, eight years between peaks. We've been riding a peak for a while now, and that's been great for everybody. I kind of ride the wave as an attorney, but obviously the business owners do too, even more so. And it's been, this wave has been going on a long time. I would hope to, uh, it, you know, again, if you're an entrepreneur, check it out because uh, you're right. The, the valuations at some point should theoretically correct. How often are you hearing from business owners that President Biden got elected 
and he ran on doubling one of the, one of the things that he had on his tax legislation was that he was going to double the capital gains rate for people earning over a million dollars, take it from 20% to the highest marginal tax rate of 39.6. How motivational is that to business owners to consider, maybe I should sell in 2021 and rather than wait a year or two and potentially face much more disadvantageous tax policy? No, that's definitely a factor when you hear that. As a matter of fact, it hasn't happened yet, right? But uh, a lot of people at the end of 2020 were saying, look, it wouldn't be surprising if it, during 2021 there was a tax, you know, depending on how the politics ended out, how the elections ended up. And we obviously got a, a slim, the slimmest of majorities for the controlling party in, in Congress. Some tax packages that are more aggressive may or may not pass, right? But when, when people were looking at this back in 2020, even pre-election, we had a number of clients saying, look, I just don't know what the picture is going to be like. And it wouldn't surprise us if during 2021, a tax package got passed, if the makeup of Congress and, and the White House lends itself to this, that a tax package got passed that had significant capital gains increase. And, you know, there's no way I want to pay that is what our business owners were, were saying. And they're saying, look, Paul, you need to get this deal done by such and such a date. I had one client we we're doing a deal for, and they said, look, I don't want to have this deal open when the election hits. So we had our marching orders to make sure that it closed you know, before before the election occurred. And we got it done, which was awesome. And then we had another deal where we were talking to a client about when we were actually doing some tax analyses, like, look, this is what you've got on the table in front of you, multiple deals. You know, if you wait, your business may be more valuable, but here's what the tax impact is going to be if you wait. And if there is a tax package passed, passed the business owner in that case had to make a decision. And her decision was, hey, I'm going gonna, gonna to move forward and do it now. How fun is it today with uh, getting offers that are 5, 10, 15 offers? How much more fun is it getting deals done with business owners when they've got <laughs> all these people to choose from? It's, it's great. I mean, it's, it's awesome. Again, from the seller side, right? Uh, it's, it's awesome. And I actually, it wasn't in this kind of way, but I had a, the experience one time where I was with a client on the phone and it was post-closing and we're just kind of doing a you know, a download and, and talking about how things went and it was awesome. And uh, he he told me, oh, I'm looking at my bank account right now. He said, oh my gosh, just out of the blue. And I said, what? And he said, I just saw the money hit my account. <laughs> <laughs> and so suddenly there were a lot more zeros after his balance. And that was a really cool feeling, you know, to, to have helped. You know, obviously I didn't build the business, right? But I was instrumental in helping him get the process done to to sell it. And that was gratifying. And He's a friend to most of my clients become friends in the process. And uh, so it was really gratifying to, to help him out and just to see you know, his family was going to be set for a while. It was, it was really uh, cool. And that, that's, that story is repeating, right? We have another deal that closed not too long ago where a couple of brothers founded a company and they sold it for a great valuation and they're running it kind of under new management. And I hear they're happy and they have a lot of money in the bank account and things are good. So I think I know who you're speaking about. I think that's my client as well. And it is super gratifying to see them uh, monetize their, their life's work and then right. get it put, see that money put, put to work to take care of themselves for the rest of their lives. That particular client was like, oh my gosh, thank goodness that got done before the pandemic. <laughs> like, oh, yeah. you know, that, that person is like, I, I just... I'm so, so very thankful that deal got done before the pandemic. Life would be very different for he and his brother had that not happened. Well, that's just really exciting. Yeah, absolutely. And that was part of the story of 2020 as well. Yeah, and that's continuing. The story of 2020 is continuing, obviously, into 2021 with, with M&A. And it, there's a lot of legal ramifications that COVID has had on, on deals, right? And uh, they're structured. These deals are structured so as... You, the buyer tries to identify every possible risk. And then there's a negotiation of who between buyer and seller are going to bear those risks. And COVID presents a significant set of risks, right? You know, can I keep my manufacturing facility open? Have I been able to? Will I, when will it open if it's not open right now? What do my numbers look like post COVID and will they rebound? Or am I a company that's benefited from COVID? You know, there's some industries, obviously, if you're making face masks, you're doing really well right now, but that may not continue once everyone's got the vaccine. So, you know, there's new analyses happening on both legal and business risks as a result of COVID. What would you tell business owners that are listening to this podcast that are thinking, gosh, I'm going to sell 
over the next zero to 36 months. What are the things that you tell business owners to start getting their ducks in a row and getting ready for sale? Yeah, that's a great question. There are a couple of things that they should know if they're, you know, 12 to 36 months out. One is to talk to a wealth advisor and not just because I'm on a wealth advisor show that I'm saying that, but there's a limited amount of time you have to make plans for um, what you're going to do with, with the cash and what you're going to do. You know, some tax may be unavoidable, right? But a good wealth advisor can help you figure out how to structure your, your family's situation with the right trusts, how to set up philanthropy, and maybe make some contributions early on of the stock of your entity so that the tax doesn't hit you. It goes to maybe a, an entity that doesn't pay tax because they're a not-for-profit. And if you were planning on doing some of that anyway, that really needs to be done earlier rather than later. You know, once a term sheet shows up on your desk, it's really hard to, to argue that your stock is worth less than what it says on that piece of paper. Even though the deal's not done yet and there's some execution risk there, your, your, your choices are limited and your, your ability to make some plans are limited once you get to that point. So you want to start planning from a wealth planning standpoint maybe Derek, you even know the number better than I do in terms of number of months, but I would say a couple of years is, is ideal. So that's from that personal standpoint. The other point I would, would make is most of our entrepreneurs are working with limited resources, right? And probably all companies are working with limited resources at some level, but entrepreneurs who, who've been kind of doing it on their own, they maybe haven't needed a corporate lawyer before. They've been making choices on where to allocate resources. And many times that's not in the legal analysis. And I, I'm not blaming anybody for that. That's kind of a rational thing to do when you've got those limited resources. And the key for you is to get sales. The key for you is to do other things to build the business. Compliance hasn't really entered into your thinking as much. That will come around at some point. When a buyer shows up and wants to buy you, um, they'll be asking all the questions that have been nagging you in the back of your mind. Have I complied with all the sales tax obligations in every state that I need to? How are my, how are my corporate minutes? Do I own, have I had all my, my employees sign agreements that assign their ideas to the company if you're in a technology space? There are lots and lots of things that we tell our clients as a matter of course they should be doing and then they may or may not happen. You know, we realize that as lawyers, we, sometimes people can't even afford to, to pick up the phone to talk to us or they decide that they don't want to because they want to allocate those resources some other place. But all those questions that went unanswered, all the risks that they knew were out there, but they couldn't deal with, the buyer will ask about them. Whether it's the buyer itself or the buyer's attorney, you're going to get a due diligence checklist or two or three uh, or more maybe that ask pointed questions about your business. The best thing to do, I think, is if you're contemplating a sale, I'd say at least 12 months out from the legal standpoint, Start thinking about calling an attorney to, to say, you know, hey, here's some of the things that are in the back of my mind that I think we probably needed to have done better. What can we do to fix those? And I have clients that come to me and, and, and do that. And we, we help them get in the best position they can uh, before the sale and before. So that when the buyer comes and says, hey, you know, tell me about X, Y, or Z, they've got an answer ready and not, oh, shoot, this is the first time I'm thinking of it. Or, yeah, I knew that was an issue, but I never quite dealt with it, never quite got around to it. When you're having those conversations with a buyer, that's going to sound like a risk to the buyer. And risk means reduction in purchase price or maybe making some of the purchase price contingent on that risk, not uh, crystallizing in the, in the near future. We take a lot of time to try and help our clients keep as much of that money as possible and not have to give it back to the buyer because something bad happened. And how far out in front of a transaction do you like to do that initial assessment to start get to give those recommendations of the things to start being implemented? I'd love to have a year. I mean, ideally you'd kind of engage us before that. Right. I mean, and I, but again, I, I know it's an allocation of resources issue, but if you're thinking that sometime in the next 12 to 24 months, I'm going to sell my company, you probably need to start thinking about getting engaged with a, with a corporate lawyer and an M&A lawyer. I happen to do both. But we help, like I said, we look at the situation and we try and clean it up. If you've got 12 months, you can probably clean up most stuff. If, you, if you're shorter than that, it's going to be tight. We'd love to have longer just because you need to have it in, in your mind as you're making business decisions day to day, right? And so you're not creating more problems. If we get involved too late, too, there's, there's also things that are going to be really hard to clean up. I'd say at least 12 months, ideally longer. If you can't call us and you're just going to call us the month before you get, you know, or you get a letter of intent, you definitely need a lawyer at that point just to negotiate and work on the deal. 
Uh, I would also just as a bit of a gratuitous remark about legal services, I'd say most of the value that we add in the process too is reviewing that letter of intent, uh, meaning we we want to be there for the cleanup in advance. We want to get that get the business ready, but you definitely need the legal help when you're negotiating the letter of intent. I would say it's really dangerous and risky to sign a letter of intent or a term sheet with a buyer, a prospective buyer, and then take that signed term sheet to your lawyer. Your lawyer's hands are pretty much bound at that point, and the lawyer will tell you, here's what I would have done if we'd had a chance to look at it. When you get a letter of intent, you definitely need a lawyer. Ideally, I'd love to have uh, that conversation about how to help clean things up, get ready, you know, 12, 18, 24 months beforehand. Paul, how about the business owner who says, hey, I've had so-and-so as my general counsel for the last 10 years, knows where all the bodies are buried. I'm just going to have that person do the, the M&A transaction, and they don't specialize in M&A. What, what do you say to that business owner? And how, how, how would your team potentially work with that business owner and their current GC? Yeah, we've had a number of clients that have kind of tried that before they came to us, and they realized during the process that it wasn't working. We actually, we enjoy, Frank, I enjoy having the, the, the prior corporate counsel involved in the process because they do know where the bodies are buried, and you're going to need to talk about that with the buyer. And so we actually like to work hand in hand with that counsel. And frankly, when, the, when that counsel sees an M&A lawyer, M&A lawyer get involved in the process and they see what we know and how we approach things and the issues that we're spotting for their clients, typically they look relieved, frankly. They come to us and say, you know, I'm so glad you're here because from a legal professional responsibility standpoint, they don't want to have created an issue. They don't want to have missed an issue. And so they're glad once, the, once they figure it out. Sometimes it can be threatening. You know, they're a longtime 20, 30-year buddy who's always used them. Now is saying they want to hire another lawyer. It sounds threatening. It sounds bad. But again, we tend to work with those people. I would highly recommend not relying solely on just your general corporate lawyer, meaning the person that you've relied on to, re, to review your contracts, your sales contracts, to, to write minutes once a year for your board or for your shareholder meeting. There's a level of sophistication that is needed for M&A and, and staying up on the trends in the legal market is very important. And that's because buyers, they have the best lawyers, right? They're, hmm. they're fully trained. They know what they're asking for. That first draft of an LOI, the first draft of a purchase agreement is going to be slanted in the buyer's favor, even if the seller doesn't recognize it or the seller's corporate lawyer doesn't recognize it. It is because they expect negotiation. They're going to expect pushback. And if the pushback doesn't happen, then the seller ends up with a worse deal. Not only that, but the buyers, when, if you talk to a buyer and they've done a bunch of deals, they'll tell you too. They'll say, look, I want someone that's a good lawyer on the other side. And part of it is because they want someone who understands the risks with all the questions that they're asking and the representations that they're asking the seller to make. They want someone that, on the other side that's going to look at those and say, hey, client, here's what you're saying. Here's what you're promising can you promise those things? If the client says, no, I can't, you know, we had this problem two years ago and it's not quite resolved or yeah, we resolved it completely. The buyer wants to know that information. They get really worried when there's no pushback on the documents because they figure the lawyer hasn't figured it out yet. We've actually had situations where buyers have called referral source for the client or you know, someone that says, and tries to get the message to the client, look, you need a better lawyer. And we've had someone call us or, you know, maybe even the seller say, Hey, I got word that I need a better lawyer in this process and we'd like to talk to you. But yeah, it's, it, it's not universally true, right? There are some corporate lawyers that are out there that can do M&A deals. But if you're not in it on a day-to-day -day basis, if you're not doing deals week after week, I don't think you're seeing the trends. I don't think you're seeing what the arguments are. I don't think you know the right responses when the buyer is asking for the world. You need someone that's going to respond to those questions and be able to fight for you and to know, to, to know the lay of the land. And usually the corporate lawyer who doesn't do M&A deals on a regular basis just doesn't know that stuff. Paul, one thing that usually comes up when I'm talking to our clients about taking their business to market, you know, they're going to monetize their life's work. And the first thing they say yeah. is, gosh, I, I don't want to spend a ton of money in fees. And typically the way that we've described it is you want to hire the best lawyer possible and view this money as an insurance policy for your life's work. Do you like that as a good analogy as to what you guys do is really making sure that you're going to try to protect that monetization in every way possible? Yeah, I think that's a fair analogy. 
part of it is you think about the dynamics of an M and A deal. You get that letter of intent and it's just pick a number, $50 million. Somebody has got a business that looks good. Letter of intent has that number on top. I'm going to get $50 million for my business. That's the starting point, right? You keep reading and it says that, first of all, letters of intent are typically non-binding, or at least the most, the part about price is non-binding. That's the letter of intent goes on to say, you're going to get $50 million, but that's subject to due diligence and subject to what we figure out about your company later, subject to a bunch of changes, subject to an escrow or hold back where there's going to be money set aside that you're going to have to pay back to the buyer if there are risks that crystallize, like I talked about before. Establishing, setting up the, the boundaries for when the buyer can take some of that money back is a key part of what we do and protecting those boundaries and saying, no, this is what's fair. This is what's not fair. Because again, the $50 million is a starting point. If you talk to any seller, obviously there's tax involved. By the time you go through the escrow holdback, maybe there's an earn out and, and other elements that reduce the, the proceeds. By the time the money hits their bank account, they're, and, and then they've got a tax bill that's due not long after that. It's a lot less than that, that first number you had in your mind. We are involved in trying to protect, to make sure that you get to keep as much of that money as possible. And if you miss something, frankly, yeah, it can be, it can be a big problem. It, there's the old saying, I'm, I'm going to get this wrong, of course, but you know, you can name your price as long as I can name the terms. That's definitely true in M&A. Yeah. And it's it just, we're protecting leakage, frankly. That 50, so you get as much of that $50 million as you can get and keep it in your bank account and not have to pay the buyer back. Paul, this is such timely information. I think that business, if you're a business owner listening to this and you want to talk to Paul about any of these things, Paul, how can they best get a hold of you? What was the best way for them to contact you? So yeah, my, if you go to the Procopio.com website, I'm up there. I believe we've got a mergers and acquisitions page, but if not, you can hit the the lawyers, uh, Paul Johnson. Uh, you can find me there. Shoot me an email. My email is on the on the website. You can call the office, ask for Paul Johnson. Uh, you can find me that way. I'm not too tough to find. I'm also on LinkedIn. I go by the VC lawyer on LinkedIn. Uh, there was a, a time when I was doing an awful lot of venture capital deals as well. I still do some, but a little more M&A now. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm on LinkedIn on the, on the website and not hard to find. I think they know how to find you. I think okay. uh, you covered it there. And uh, Paul, such timely information. If you're a business owner and you have questions, Paul's one of the very best. Reach out to Paul. Paul, thank you for coming in today. I'm going to throw it over to Eric. Eric, thank you for having this podcast again with us today. Absolutely. No, I, I love sitting here and, and learning from all the guests that you guys are bringing on and just uh, finding out more and more information about things I didn't know before and things that we need to be thinking about. So again, thank you so much for bringing them on the show. And of course, our last thank you goes to you, the listening audience. Thank you for listening to the Live Life Liberated podcast with the team from Centura Wealth Advisory. If you have not subscribed to the podcast yet, please click the subscribe now button below. This way, when they come out with a new podcast, it'll show up directly on your listening device. This makes it much easier to share these podcasts with your friends and family. Again, thanks so much for listening today. For everyone at Centura Wealth Advisory, this is Eric Johnson reminding you to live your best day every day, and we'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to the Live Life Liberated podcast. Click the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of Centura Wealth Advisory. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding your investment planning. Centura Wealth Advisory, Centura, is an SEC registered investment advisor with its principal place of business in San Diego, California. Centura and its representatives are in compliance with the current registration and notice filing requirements imposed on SEC registered investment advisors, in which Centura maintains clients. Centura may only transact business in those states in which it is notice filed or qualifies for an exemption or exclusion from notice filing requirements. Past performance is no guarantee of future results. Tax relief varies based on client circumstances and all clients do not achieve the same results. 